Excellent. Okay. So you can imagine that the person on the right, that's me in my younger days, is speaking now. So I'm really happy to be introducing Chiu Lang, uh, who's going to be giving the second of these short presentations today. Now, the uh, Chiu got her PhD at MIT, but what many of you probably don't know is that she started out her studies thinking about nuclear engineering. And for reasons that only she knows, she thought perhaps I was too concrete or too engineering-like to really finish a worthwhile PhD in. So instead, she turned to the perhaps more concrete topic of interacting photons. Now, obviously, this is a bit of a specious thing, usually, because photons don't interact very much. Um, but uh, experimentally, and also in collaboration, in fact, with Alexi, um, doing the theory part, she was able to realize this in a fantastic PhD. Then thinking perhaps that this also is too concrete, after all the photons at least were things, um, she came to JQI to work on ultracold atoms and optical lattices in which you will see multiple uh, levels of abstraction required to finally understand the physics under description. So perhaps this is gonna be Chiu's ultimate level of abstraction. And either way, she can abstract more and become more concrete as she moves on to her faculty position at Purdue at the end of this coming summer. So I'd like to everyone to join me in welcoming to you, and I'm sure this will be a great talk. Uh, and take it away. Thank you for this nice introduction, and thank you for hosting here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the money sources and the fantastic team I work with uh, on this project. Um, Dimitri was a postdoc here. Uh, he started this project back then and he's now in Italy. Uh, I'm a postdoc with Ian Spielman, as you already know. So I think this uh, title is kind of too abstract. So I decided to give you an extended version, observe coherent evolution under noisy environment using hopper hofstede model in a tube. And the talk will be structured like this. First, I'm going to warm you up with the memory of a horizontal bound interferometer. And then I'll tell you how we build a horizontal bound like interferometer using Hopper Hofstede model in a tube geometry. Uh, Hopper Hofstede model is a 2D lattice model with a uniform magnetic field perpendicular to the lattice plane. And here I'm drawing. Uh, lattice with only three sides along the horizontal axis. And if you can couple the edge M states zero to two here, then you will make a tube that looks kind of similar to the Horn of Bong interferometer. We managed to thread a longitudinal flux phi L here and study the dynamics on the tube in a similar fashion as uh, this uh, Horn of Bong interferometer where you split charge particles, let them go around the solenoid and then recombine them. And then when you observe the phase difference between the two paths, it is proportional to the magnetic flux along this long axis of the tube. Since our uh, system is analogous to a horn of bound interferometer, we expected to see the phase sensitivity to this longitudinal flux by L. We sort of observed it, but to our surprise, the sensitivity can be suppressed by introducing quasi disorder. So here, this graph, uh, each dot is an experimental run, and each experimental run, we associate the uh, system with a different longitudinal flux. So the variance of these um, dots shows you the phase sensitivity of the system to uh, phi L. And if you add a quasi disorder, you can see this sensitivity uh, basically went away. Uh, this was very surprising. Uh, in my opinion, there are two types of experiments. First is uh, you verify some theoretical prediction, and that's nice. And second is very adventurous. You don't quite know what you are looking at, everything is full of surprises and our project definitely falls into this category and it was very exciting um, to um, understand what's going on in the experiment. So that might make you very confused already. So let me back up and then start from the very beginning. Let me first 
in general, introduce atom interferometers using Maxander interferometer, for example. So up here uh, is a Maxander interferometer for light. If you want to use a coherent source, then you start with a laser and you split it uh, and recombine it and then detect uh, the light on these two ports. And the fringes will tell you the phase difference between these two paths and labeled as little phi here. In analogy for atoms, um, the coherent source is a bosons and condensate. Uh, we, uh, the analogous part of the beam splitter and the mirrors are uh, pi over two pulses and pi pulses. So we basically manipulate these uh, atoms with laser light. So the matter and light, the row are switched in these atom interferometers. And the detection is also different. Uh, here we need to take a state dependent imaging uh, to, to, to look at the fringes. And an uh, example of this kind of imaging is our uh, time of light uh, absorption imaging that can uh, separate the states here are labeled by M. And also we can uh, resolve the momentum and along this horizontal axis. And this kind of absorption imaging will be our detection tools uh, in, in this experiment. Back to the Horn of Bound interferometer. Uh, we are not the first one building a Horn of Bound like interferometers. Uh, here are some usages. Uh, on the left is the uh, use this idea to measure the pi berry flux uh, around a direct point. And on the right, uh, these spirals in the middle are anions. So this interferometer is to uh, measure the anion statistics. And these two paths are like this, this one path, and the second path is here around this anion. So our approach is to uh, start with hopper hofstadter model. This model has two terms, the hopping term along the two di di dimensions. And notably, the hopping along one dimension has a phase. It's a complex hopping such that when the particle go around a lattice placade, it will pick up a horn of bound phase. And this phase is proportional to the magnetic flux. And if you look at this model, you will see that this is how this is the only way that the magnetic field entering this model. And, and so basically, if you can engineer a hard of bound phase, then you don't need to actually uh, apply a real magnetic field. And that is the approach we are taking. We engineer this uh, phase by Raman transition. So these M states are internal atomic states. Uh, for us, they are the F equals one manifold of rubidium atoms, and they are not MF state. And for details of these states, you can look at this reference. And so when the atoms uh, hop from M side to M equals uh, M, M plus one side, uh, it scatters two photons and picking up two Raman recoil and two H bar K R. And meanwhile, this Raman coupling will give you a phase factor uh, proportional to uh, 2KRx. And the uh, few line algebra will show you that the transverse flux phi in this model here is equal to uh, the ratio of the wave number of the two lasers involved. The lattice laser um, is used to create the insights along this direction. So because we are using Raman coupling for, for this uh, short dimension, there's nothing preventing us from connecting M equals zero to M equals two. And that way you get the tube. So originally on the planar geometry, the little phase phi here, this relative phase between the two Raman beams has no physical consequences. But once you roll it into a tube, you can follow this uh, orange trajectory here. And when you go around uh, like this, then there's 
a longitudinal flux, and this little fine now make a contribution to the longitudinal flux, and this should have a physical effect. And as we argued from the Horn of Bond interferometer, and when we talk about uh, uh, sensitivity to the longitudinal flux, we actually mean sensitivity to this little phi here. Uh, I want to summarize some features of this unique realization of a hyper Hofstadter model. First, we can tune the uh, transverse flux phi uh, very easily by tuning the Raman wavelength because it's just the ratio of the wave vectors. And if you apply a real magnetic field to a real crystal, the required magnetic field is impossibly large, it's 10 to the fourth Teslas. Second, we have control over boundary conditions. As I told you, you can um, choose to put this uh, frequency component in your Raman beams or not. Third, we have single site resolution along the azimuthal direction for free without complex imaging systems um, because we just uh, perform this state dependent imaging that I showed you earlier. And lastly, this realization make it very asymmetric. There's a very short dimension and very long dimension and you can utilize that to study certain physics. Uh, for example, our uh, experiment actually uh, make use of this fact. So here is our experimental sequence. We start the atoms from uh, M equals one site. Uh, we adiabatically load them to a 1D optical lattice. The depth is five recoil and the resulting hopping uh, term is 0 0.066 recoil. And time T, we suddenly switch on JS uh, and let this atom evolve for a certain time t. After that, we suddenly shut off uh, the dipole trap, the optical lattice, and the Raman coupling, and keep track of how many atoms are in each of these M sites. And <laughs> each experimental run, we randomly sample a little phi here, and this is uh, the result uh, of the probability for the atoms to stay in the initial M equals one site after uh, this evolution time t. You can see it, at, at the beginning, the variance is quite small. And after some characteristic length, uh, time scale, the variance become very large. And this uh, time scale is set by um, the time scale of maximal population transfer uh, out of the initial site. Uh, and because we have a very short dimension, so when these atoms are maximally out of the initial site is also the time scale uh, going around the solenoid if you are thinking on uh, uh, AB interferometer. So that's when we expect the interference to happen. Um, but that's not the end of the story. Uh, we found that this expected variance only there if we are uh, operating very close to or exactly on two thirds. If we uh, move the transverse flux away from two thirds by even just uh, a little bit, then we found a huge suppression of this variance or the phase sensitivity. And why do I call this one over 84 irrational? It's because for a finite system, <clears throat> I, uh, <laughs> For the flux P over Q, you only need the, de the denominator Q to be larger than the system size to be effectively irrational. And our system size is uh, about 40 sites uh, measured by uh, independently measured uh, Thomas Fernie radius of the uh, BEC, that is uh, 11.5 micrometer. So over some range, um, we can look at how the variance uh, change as a function of phi, we see this sharply peaked uh, and two thirds at all evolution time t. That's still not the end of the surprises. Um, if you instead of 
putting all the experimental results on the graph, but we actually average those results, we find, we find that the mean time of evolution is very similar regardless of the transverse flux being rational or irrational as long as uh, the numbers are close by. So looking over this whole range, uh, we see that uh, it is definitely very smooth, uh, it has no sharp peak. To understand these surprises, uh, I'll give you first a qualitative picture. If you look at the uh, Hamiltonian or look at the longitudinal flux, you will see that the dynamics at site n can be viewed as if it's on set n equals zero, but with another uh, little phi uh, that includes this uh, two pi big phi n contribution. So what it tells us is that as you go down the cylinder, you are doing some sort of uh, averaging over the longitudinal flux already. And if it's a irrational flux, uh, then this each side will have a different longitudinal flux than if the system size is large, then you are performing a spatial self-averaging. Well, on the other hand, if uh, the transverse flux is rational, for example, two thirds, then when you go down the cylinder, you are only uh, cycling through three uh, values of uh, longitudinal flux. I mean, the uh, so-called little phi, right? Because the uh, phase wrap around two pi. So from this piece of information, we can already kind of understand all of, uh, of observations qualitatively, because if you uh, already have a self-averaging effect, then whether I randomize the longitudinal flux or not, it doesn't make a difference in the system dynamics. And if I actually averaging the longitudinal flux for the, era, for the rational uh, transverse flux, then it, it is completing this uh, uh, average, self-averaging effect, sampling all the possible longitudinal flux. However, this simple analysis does not show uh, quantitatively how much variance we expect in the time evolution. To understand that, I will transform to uh, the momentum space. We do a Fourier transform such uh, that the n site will become crystal momentum Q, and the resulting Hamiltonian is a series of one-dimensional uh, Aubrey Andre model in the momentum space. It also has two terms. The first one is hopping between uh, the new lattice site, J, and each J index is a certain uh, M state and a momentum state. And second term is onset energy uh, through this cosine J phi uh, dependence. It is sampling the cosine function in a sort of random way, right? um, causing this uh, quasi disordered onsite energy if uh, the big phi is irrational. So if you hate math, you can understand everything from this graph here. So each M state has its own uh, dispersion relation in the optical lattice. And if you start with M equals one and Q equals zero, uh, the Raman coupling will take you to a different M state while imparting a two photon recoil. It's 2H bar KR and KR equals KL phi. Um, after three hawkings, you are back to the original M state with a little momentum mismatch. And this mismatch is uh, three times uh, 2H bar KL phi. If this mismatch is within this uh, initial momentum wave packet, we expect uh, it will interfere with this initial wave packet. So it's like 
one taking one particle going around the horn of bound interferometer and back to itself and see its interference. So under this condition, our system is interfer interferometrically sensitive to little phi. And so we see that uh, this sensitivity peak here is just a, a time average variance uh, agrees with our uh, argument. And although our experiment does not probe very far from two thirds, uh, we can run numerical simulation over the full range and we'll see some uh, distinct peaks uh, at some simple uh, rational transverse flux. And in particular, this five, six, this peak is lower than two thirds because in order to see the interference, the uh, hopping has to cycle twice uh, through this M state. And quantitatively, what, what is governing this, uh, how, how much uh, variance we see is this uh, overlap integral of the momentum space wave function. And it's exactly what you expect from a simple uh, interference argument. Um, going towards the future, we have created a new playground of quasi disorder. Our experiment probed the short term dynamics, but if you wait long enough, so for example, the, suppose this uh, momentum mismatch is actually larger than the spread of the wave packet, then you won't see interference after three helping. But if you wait really long, eventually this mismatch will accumulate to zero. And then you can see the interference emerging if you are in a delocalized regime. Uh, on the other hand, if the system is in the localized regime, then we don't expect to see that kind of um, re re emerging of the phase sensitivity. And second, what we did can be potentially engineered to be a new type of decoherence free subspace. It means that you have some protected space that are robust against certain noise. And this can be useful in quantum information processing or uh, interferometric measurements. An example of experimentally demonstrated uh, decoherence-free subspace is a singlet. This is robust against a magnetic field that shifts the relative phase between the two uh, spins in the same way, right? If you put that phase shift in, then this single state is totally untouched. Uh, lastly, um, what our system is, is sort of a precursor of uh, Laughlin's topological charge pump one can engineer and it's uh, actually proposed uh, to be used to characterize many body topological invariants. Uh, what you need is to time varying this longitudinal flux, and this is equivalent to generate uh, electric field along the azimuthal direction. And together with this transverse flux, you will pump atoms down the tube, and the center of mass motion of the atomic cloud um, will review the many body topological uh, invariants if you are having, say, a qu fractional quantum horse state or something like that. Um, our paper is on archive today. Uh, you can check it out if you are interested. And there's a related theory paper just next to our paper on the archive. Uh, I'm moving to uh, Purdue in August. Uh, I'm, of course, looking for uh, postdocs and uh, graduate students. Uh, if you are interested in this work or uh, you know somebody who might be interested in working at Purdue, uh, please help me uh, spread the word uh, or contact me. So thank you for your attention. So I'd like to open up the floor for questions for you. So feel free to just jump on in, say your name and ask what you got. 
Uh, it's Charles here. It's not a question. It's a comment. I see that uh, there's a related theory paper by Chi Jo, who, uh, well, he was here at JQI as a postdoctoral fellow probably so long ago now that there's no overlap with anyone uh, among the graduate students or postdocs in the audience. But he's had a great career at Purdue. And it's, uh, you know, the, the, the quantum center there. It's a first-rate place. Thank you. End of statement. <laughs> so after further advertising for Purdue, are there any other uh, scientific questions for Chief? Maybe I can ask a very broad question. So I guess, like, what would you have to, to add to this to get the Laughlin charge pump? Since you left us with that wonderful teaser. Oh, um, so first, like very straightforwardly, like maybe you already know that uh, basically we are just randomly sampling the longitudinal flux you definitely need to have a very good control of it to like vary it as a function of time, right? That, that's a very simple technical thing. Um, but then I think my, my feeling is that to, uh, oh, I think that will just give you, maybe if you have a, a quantum force state and then you have a, a sort of a topological charge pump, but what is actually interesting is to bring it to many body regime and that is, I think, is more work on your system than the pump. Uh, so I, I've seen, like, pro of course, you need to have uh, interactions, right? I've, I've seen proposals with, like, say, uh, interacting fermions or some, say, hard war bosons. So I, I think you first need to engineer your interesting uh, Laughlin states, and, and then you can use your pump there. Okay, thank you. 